About 450 million years ago, plants took a giant leap out of the oceans onto the land to become the plants that we know and love today. But how did they survive? Scientists at the John Innes Centre may have found out. Land plants survive by getting water and nutrients from the soil. They do this by forming a special friendship with soil-dwelling fungi called mycorrhiza. These strands of mycorrhiza reach deep into the soil and drag the nutrients and water back to the plants. But when the first algae landed on soil, how did they survive long enough to form these beneficial friendships? New research suggests that they already had the genes necessary for forming this bond whilst they still lived in the sea. Researchers analysed DNA and RNA from some of the earliest known land plants and algae. They found evidence that their shared algal ancestors living in the Earth's waters already possessed the necessary set of genes needed to detect and interact with the beneficial mycorrhiza. The team of scientists believes this capability was pivotal in enabling the alga to survive out of the water and to colonise the Earth. By working with the fungi to find sustenance, the alga showed a clear evolutionary advantage and was selected to thrive in a very different and seemingly infertile environment. This was the watershed moment that kick-started the evolution of life on Earth. To give you an idea on the geological timescale, Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. And life itself dates back to about 3.5 billion years. On the other hand, land plants are much more recent, since their last common ancestor has been estimated to roughly 470 million years. So just to be clear, all of the dates given here are approximate. Some are still being debated. We provide them here only to give you a general idea of the timescale. If we zoom on the last 500 million years, we think that seed plants, uh, the large group that includes flowering plants and conifers, dates back to about 320 million years. To give some context, back then there were no mammals or birds yet, but terrestrial and aquatic animals were already quite diverse. On this time scale, flowering plants are remarkably young. Indeed, the oldest known fossils of flowering plants are about 140 million years old. This is still quite old if we remember that dinosaurs became extinct only 66 million years ago. With the exception, of course, of birds, which are little dinosaurs with wings. So the extraordinary diversity of flowering plants is the result of only 140 million years of evolution. During this time period, flowering plants became progressively dominant in most ecosystems. Today it is by far the most diversified group of land plants. About 9 in 10 plants are flowering plants. As you might know, we have been thinking of evolution for only about 250 years. More precisely since 1859, which is when Charles Darwin published the first version of The Origin of Species. Already back then, at the same time when he proposed his theory of variation and natural selection, Darwin imagined that it would be possible one day to reconstruct the genealogical tree of all living species to represent their evolutionary history. Today, this representation called phylogeny, or phylogenetic trees, has become a universal tool to understand the evolution of all groups of living organisms, plants, animals, fungi, bacteria. The tips of the tree represent living species, those present at time zero, in other words, uh, right now, as all plants, ourselves, squirrels, ants, all living organisms. The nodes of this tree, if we go down this figure, represent the ancestors of these species, those that lived in the past. So the way to read this tree is from top to bottom, if we want to go back in time. In addition, this tree has now become the basis for the classification of all flowering plants. This is the APG system. However, phylogenetic trees are not only useful for classification, they are also primarily useful to understand the evolution of all forms of life. So now I'm going to give you an example. This is a simplified phylogeny of all land plants. These include uh, mosses, lycopods, horsetails, ferns, conifers, and flowering plants. Just to be clear, here I am really simplifying the story. This is only to give you an idea of what this tree looks like. So this tree allows us to trace back some important events in the history of land plants. First of all, the emergence out of water, which characterizes all of land plants. 
Then, the origin of vessels, which characterize uh, all the so-called vascular plants. This tree also allows us to show the origin of seeds, which characterize all the so-called seed plants. Uh, in other words, the group that includes conifers, a number of other uh, small plant groups in flowering plants. Last, this tree allows us to note the emergence of flowers, which characterize all flowering plants. To clarify, this tree certainly doesn't mean that flowering plants are more evolved than other plants. It all depends on the context. So how can we go back in time to reconstruct plant evolution? All that we can see today is the result of evolution. We only see living organisms in all their diversity of shapes and forms. With this diversity of living plants, it is far from obvious to reconstruct the past from only the present. And yet, this is what we do. How does it work? Let's imagine flowers with three petals and other flowers with five petals. In this situation here, it is quite easy to imagine with this phylogeny that these four species with five petals share a common ancestor, which also had flowers with five petals. On the other hand, the common ancestor of all these plants probably had an ancestor of three petals. Indeed, the simplest scenario is the one involving a single transition from three to five petals on this branch. But if one of these species instead had three petals, then things become more complicated. There are two possibilities. Either we keep the same scenario, but with a transition back to three petals in the species. This is what we call a reversal. Or the five petals evolve twice independently in this group. This is what we call convergence. These two processes, uh, reversal and convergence, are very interesting from an evolutionary point of view. For instance, the loss of limbs or legs in snakes uh, is a reversal compared to their tetrapod ancestors, which themselves, as you and I, are derived from ancestors that originally lacked limbs and look more like what we would call fish. So how do we reconstruct phylogenetic trees? The easiest solution would be to use direct traces from the past, in other words, fossils, in order to reconstruct phylogenetic history. Unfortunately, this is impossible for uh, most living groups. With just a few exceptions, for most groups, especially plants, we know some fossils, but there are not enough fossils to reconstruct phylogenetic trees with precision. So initially, biologists uh, started to use the morphology of living plants to trace back their phylogeny. Today, we rather tend to use DNA for this purpose, roughly since the 1990s. So it is thanks to DNA and to more and more powerful computers that it is possible now to evaluate among the thousands or billions of billions of possible phylogenetic trees, which or which ones best explain the data we observe now.